Hi, um, welcome everybody. Uh, if we can wait uh, just a minute or two, that would be great for people to show up. I think you may have, well, you're waiting for Chris to. Um, I know Laura is unable to make the meeting today. And just so you know, the meeting is recording. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Won't say anything. Um, I just also need to set up my desktop here to be ready to uh, start facilitating. Okay, great. So should we wait for Chris? Do you think, Stephanie? Um, maybe just give her one more minute. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and let me just um, mention that, uh, uh, Jack, are you, um, it's your turn for taking minutes. Are you okay with that? Oh, I, th I thought maybe it was my turn. I, I think it's oh, sorry, Dwayne. sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm I mean, I'd be happy myself. to I'm be on myself. myself today. I made myself a really organized uh, <laughs> calendar, um, and uh, I have Martha down for minutes today. I was going to get to the at the end of the meeting. Jack, you're on deck for next time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. All right, okay, but Martha, yes, you're on uh, on um, minute duty today, um, and we'll get to the minutes in a mo in a moment for for to review and to vote on for today. But we'll wait just a moment. And um, thank Dan for his minutes um, last time and that we'll be reviewing and voting on momentarily. Uh, let's see. So other than, uh, are we missing anybody except Lauren? Laura? Uh, no, Laura okay, so uh, is the too. only one and Chris is on her way in. Great. Okay. And um, let's see if we have any public. Yeah, we do have some public. Okay, good. So I think you have everyone now, Dwayne. Okay, to get started. Okay, great. Okay, well, welcome everybody, and thanks, uh, thanks again for um, being part of this working group and and uh, this meeting today. Um, we have the uh, the agenda uh, that Stephanie provided. Um, we'll have um, uh, following up from from last week on the um, uh, mapping capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. For, for the town that um, we were presented uh, last time. Uh, Chris is gonna give us a little bit of an overview of, of land use and mapping in, in Amherst. Um, uh, I had a good conversation with Martha yesterday, I believe it was, um, with regard to, um, she'll be providing some uh, background on the, um, at the state level on the decarbonization roadmap. Uh, and she has a presentation to walk us through that, which appreciate. Um, and uh, and then we want to dig into the um, to, to to the uh, work plan and timeline, uh, and appreciate uh, input that Janet provided uh, on that. And basically, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the agenda. Uh, hopefully, if we can, to sort of merge those two, so we have one document um, and work plan to to work from. Um, and then we'll um, definitely want to save more time than we did last time um, on uh, scheduling our next meeting uh, and the uh, and agenda items. Uh, and, and then we'll have time for public comment as well uh, at the end of the of the uh, of this of the meeting. Um, and Chris, welcome. And your hand is up. So do you have a question or or a comment? Chris, you're we can't hear you. Okay, you're 
microphone, it sounds like it's not working. Hold on. Yeah, you don't, you're not muted, but. You're not muted. So I just took my headset off. Now my microphone is probably working. Yes, now we can hear you. I guess I will leave it that way and hopefully my colleagues in the office won't be disturbed. But there must be something wrong with my headset. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, great. Okay, so uh, with that, um, let's get on with the agenda, uh, which is first to review and update and uh, vote on the minutes from uh, our last meeting on July 29th. Um, again, thank you um, to um, uh, Dan for taking those minutes. Um, I thought they were very thorough. Um, and uh, um, um, I thought we, we could take a look at that, but I also wanted to get, because the question came up when I was talking to some other people, uh, just Stephanie, in terms of, of what your expectations are for, for the minutes, uh, I thought Dan's were definitely um, thorough, uh, but other people were sort of asking also in terms of how, how, um, how you know, little guidelines maybe with regard to um, how detailed um, and the scope of the minutes that are expected sort of from, from our note takers. So minutes are not meant to be transcripts. They are meant to capture the essence of the conversation if there are significant points made, um, but it's not, it shouldn't necessarily be um, speculative information. Um, it should just be a general summary and anything that is um, voted on absolutely needs to be recorded. The vote needs to be recorded um, whether someone abstained. So we need that, de that needs to be detailed in terms of who abstained. Um, but other than that, it's really just, they should be more of a summary. It's a little, it's a, it's one of those things where every person does them differently. So I would just say, you know, I typically just try to work with whatever someone sends me. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to spend so much time on them that I'm going to summarize everything. If someone submits really detailed information, I typically try to sift through and just sort of get rid of some of the more superfluous con con comments that don't really contribute anything to the understanding of what the conversation was about. So I would say, you know, do your best. I'll try to whittle them down as best I can, but there's not going to be a standard format that everybody does. It just, I've never, in all the years that I've worked with committees, I've never had a committee that had one set of minutes that looked the same for every meeting. It's, it just varies on who the person is who's taking the minutes. So Stephanie, that you're saying that you do review the minutes that the recorder submits then? Yes, I do. And, and I'll add, add inf 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 that you edit them. I edit them just to make sure if there's information that's missing. Sometimes people will make a comment to me, please fill in this information. And I go back to the recording. Uh -huh. I, I almost always go back to the recording and go through the recording and try to pick out the information that might be missing. Or if something isn't accurately I, I try to catch if something isn't accurately, if I remember it differently than what it looks like was written, I might double check. Um, but, you know, we, we can only spend so much time on them as well. So we try to do our best to capture what might be missed. Okay. And, and the recording is, uh, is uh, provided online, right? So that's, Correct. that's the public transcript if anybody needs to or wants to. Uh, go go into the into the further detail, uh, but but uh, in my mind, the minutes should at least um, inform folks of what was discussed, and if there's more detail they want to find out specifically what was said, um, um, in in the in in detail, they can go to the recording. All right, great. So with with that in mind, um, let's take a moment to uh, um, entertain any. Well, let me first, uh, I should probably for the recording say that um, uh, this is the meeting uh, of the Solar Bylaw Working Group uh, for August 11th, 2022. Um, and um, uh, for, for, for the record. <laughs> um, so um, uh, let's turn our attention to the minutes, the draft minutes uh, from our last meeting, 729. And hopefully people have had a chance to review them. And I'm open to any uh, comments or thoughts or suggested amendments to those minutes before we entertain a vote. Do 
Jack has his hand oh. raised. Oh, good. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Uh, yep. A very, very, very small edit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just in section four, uh, it says I was a former commissioner. I'm, I'm still the commissioner uh, for the town. They're gotcha. probably alternate. But, um, great. Yep. I think that's, that's important. Okay, yeah. great. So uh, with that amendment, uh, anything, any other comments? Um, if not, would anybody like to put forward a motion to accept the minutes as amended uh, by that one striking of, of the word forum, former? I move to accept the minutes as amended. Great. Have... Who, who is the second on that? Robert. Great, Robert, thank you. Um, and then um, okay, we'll take we a vote, roll call vote. Voice vote. So um, please unmute yourself so that I can hear your voice vote. Corcoran? Accept. Brooks? Yes. Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Jemsek? Approved. McGowan? Aye. Okay, that's approved. Great, thank you for that all. Okay. Um, running the agenda again. Okay, great. So uh, next item on the agenda are any staff updates. <clears throat> uh, why don't we start with Stephanie and then uh, and then Chris? Sure. So um, an update on the solar uh, assessment. I'll give it now just to get it out of the way. Um, we haven't had any responses quite yet because we did have a request for an extension by two firms. So we've extended the proposal submission date by two weeks, uh, but we had two firms definitely interested and one that is actually conducting the statewide assessment uh, sent in an inquiry about that uh, proposal. And I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that they submit a proposal. Um, that would be fantastic if we could get them. So, but uh, um, we have to get the, you know, we haven't heard any more than that, but there are at least three that have expressed interest. And, and um, just for clarification, when you say uh, two weeks extended, when when would that push the, the response date to? Uh, I, I believe it's the 29th. Okay, so, so still in August, yeah, great. Still in August. Yeah. All right, good. Um, Yep, I've sorry, I didn't see whose hand was raised first, so I'll go with Martha. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I don't know then whether this is the time, whether you're going to do uh, discuss the solar assessment uh, later, but if this is the time, I, I would like to raise a couple of questions. Is this uh, the time? You know, after reading over the RFP, I do have a couple of uh, questions and uh, puzzlements here about it, um, you know, for namely, what is the role of our committee in relation to the consultant? I mean, I see in here wording about, you know, consulting with town staff, consulting with the ECAC, but there's no mention of our committee until the very end when we get to hear the report. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, you know, we we need to to work with them. We shouldn't just be working, you know, separately in parallel and have no contact till the end. I think I, I don't think that's very effective. And and also, I, I have some concerns about the um, wording here that there's no mention of our town's master plan or our town's clean energy plan. I know that this spring I actually signed up and took a, a zoning workshop in preparation for this committee. And what was stressed there was the importance that zoning regulations had to use their, their municipality's master plan as a guideline. You know, this is something that's vetted and approved by the council and, and so on. And we also have our, our good PARP report uh, too. And so I wondered why those weren't specifically mentioned as as guidelines so those are my questions i'll how about i answer the second question first Duane, okay. and then do you want to respond to the first question sure 
So as far as the uh, resource materials, we don't necessarily always identify the resource materials uh, within the RFP because those will be given to the consultant as resource documents. So that's just, I mean, those will be the, and they will in fact be the main resource documents, documents that they will be provided mm -hmm. uh, to work from. So we just don't, uh, you know, there's enough information that we have to sort of cull through to get the RFP together. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not, um, yeah, it's not imperative that that be included in the language. Yes, I so I guess really the the, the difference is not so much the RFP as then when the the scope of work is written for the consultant, you know, after they're hired and your town staffs preparing the contract and so on. It would seem to me that if you're going to put in things about, you know, consulting and being informed by the town and the ECAC and so on, that, that those documents and perhaps also the, uh, the, the state decarbonization plan should be mentioned as, as guidelines to, uh, to follow and inform the work. Um, sh sure, we can put them in the document. I mean, I think there's no question that those will have to be guiding documents, but we can put that in the contract at the mm -hmm. time when that gets developed. There, there is a scope of work that's already been developed as part of the RFP, but um, I think once the consultant comes on board and we finalize mm -hmm. um, the language for the contract, we can certainly include those things. There's no reason why we can't. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of us in our own professional experience have uh, you know, worked with uh, writing of work plans for contractors or for grant proposals and so on. And so it seems to me that it's important to, to get things down in writing because that really does influence what results you're going to get is, is, is you know, how you phrase things. And so I wonder if, the, if our committee here uh, could have an opportunity uh, simply to give the town staff our inputs or recommendations as to uh, items that uh, should be included in that final contract. Obviously the town staff, you know, you folks are the ones that write it, but uh, since it involves our committee's work, whether we could uh, make recommendations at all. Um, we would probably work through the chair as we did in drafting this RFP. So if you all had, I would say that the best pathway would be to get your comments to Duane and Duane would be reviewing the draft basically on behalf of the committee. So I would say if you have specific comments, get them to Duane. And when we draft the contract, we would allow Duane to review. Typically staff works with the town manager because the contract is really with the town and the town manager. So it's not necessarily common for committees to be weighing in on contracts like that. But in this case, because of the work that you're doing personally, I feel like I'm certainly willing to at least work with the chair on making sure that this contract is reflective of um, the desire of the committee and reflective of the work you're doing. So if you wanna provide those to Duane, I think that would work. Okay. Okay, thank Great, you. And, and maybe I can just comment on, on the first part of your question with regard to the engagement opportunities to, for the uh, this working group to interact and engage with the chosen um, contractor. And I think there is, uh, as I see it, there's sort of two, two opportunities. One, as you mentioned before, is sort of it towards the end, uh, some uh, uh, review and uh, uh, input given to the to the uh, outcomes of of the of the um, analysis, um, but um, but at the front end, um, you know, I think as I see the charge of our charge as well, and I think it's it is also in our work plan document that we'll be getting at later today later in in in, in our meeting here, is that um, while the consultant uh, will be. Uh, within their scope of work, um, facilitating and engaging in the community engagement aspect of their of their uh, of, of this uh, solar assessment, um, we do have an opportunity and 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 a, and a role uh, to provide some input into what um, uh, what that form of engagement and content uh, and qu and questioning that we want we as a as a working group want to uh, suggest to the consultant. Um, to 
um, learn from the community in which uh, our community uh, that they're engaged with. Um, and so I see it as our, uh, in our scope, uh, and it's actually in our work plan, at least the draft that I had, uh, and we'll get to that later, a, a period of time where we, and we'll probably tee this up for um, maybe not the next, but the next meeting um, is to start putting together a um, uh, some input uh, and recommendations that we have uh, with regard to the um, community engagement that the uh, consultants will be uh, um, facilitating uh, sometime in their scope of work. Um, I think it's important, you know, to recognize that you know the the, the consultant is contracted with the with the with the town, uh, and is 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 as Stephanie mentioned is uh, you know um, responsible to meet the contract terms to, uh, to the town. Uh, we are here as a um, uh, as a volunteer committee, also working and providing input to the town, uh, and and uh, so there's a mechanism here. But we 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 are not the managers of the consultant. Uh, and we can provide input, uh, but that's really done as part of the scope of work uh, that, that has been laid out. Okay, I think- um, Jack has his hand up, sorry. Well, uh, Janet, somebody, yeah, oh. Janet, you had your hand up before, so sorry. Yeah, so, and, um, and then that Jack, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the lack of, um, like there's no mention of our group. And it seems to me that in the scope of work that the, um, the um, consultant would want to meet with us and talk to us about what we'd like to see in the solar assessment and look at. Um, and just, you know, to acknowledge that we're going to be looking at the assessment and then applying it and deciding priorities and a map and things like that. So it'd be good for the consultant to understand what our work is. And we're sort of bleeding into a later agenda item. So I was struck by the absence of mention of our group. And I thought it'd be good in the scope of work to give a heads up that our work is to do a priority map and figure out like what we recommend as priority locations for solar de development. And our work also is to do community outreach. So we should just work on that together. And I don't see our role as advising the consultant on how to do community outreach. I see our role as working together with it. Um, or we do a separate path because that's what the town council asked us to do. That doesn't make sense. So I think the scope of work should reflect how the consultant is going to work with us and that he will or she, and then also what are what we're trying to do. So it also looks to me like the consultant's work is informing some questions and issues that ECAC has about um, you know meeting targets and things like that. And so, you know, so I, I was kind of I had questions about like is what does ECAC want from this solar assessment? Are they looking to make a separate recommendation? Are they looking at specific targets? I know that's not the work of our committee. You know, we're not supposed to be saying, here's how you get a target A or B or C, but I was wondering if ECAC was um, looking at that, if they wanted that kind of information. So scope of work, what's ECAC looking for and hoping to do? Or are they hoping to do something with it? I don't know. Um, I can, I can um, you know, talk, respond as, as sort of the representative from ECAC, uh, though I, I must admit I was not able to meet the meet, meet, meet our um, ECAC meeting yesterday. So if that, if anything did come up, Stephanie can, can add to that. Um, but, um, you know, as, as we see it, the, the um, this technical assessment uh, consultant is, uh, is just that it's a technical analysis. Uh, it's not opining. Uh, on on uh, on 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 the issues or the perspectives, um, it's mapping out, um, providing information that's going to be useful to the town, useful to ECAC, useful to to our working group, mm -hmm. um, with regard to more of the technical potential uh, of solar uh, in various different forms uh, in, in 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 the town. Um, uh, um, and, and that will be um, inform critically informative uh, to both ECAC and, the, and, and our zoning bylaw working group uh, with regard to um, uh, our, both of our missions. Um, for ECAC, 
Um, uh, as you know, the, the, with ECAC recommendations, the town has adopted um, carbon neutral goals uh, by certain dates. Um, and that um, part of that, uh, part of the, the, the planning there is um, to what extent um, can, so, can Amherst host its own, uh, its own energy production. It doesn't suggest that we need, the town needs to get all of its energy from, from, uh, from hosting its own solar uh, or, or renewable energy generally, uh, but um, it'll be helpful to know uh, what that uh, technical potential is, both on the built environment and on the unbuilt environment. Um, and, uh, and the idea with the scenarios that were put forward in the scope of work is to uh, give our committees uh, a sense of, of um, a scope and scale uh, that we are talking about. But again, the technical consultant in my mind is not offering um, a prescription of what we should do, uh, but what is technically uh, possible uh, or um, not possible. Uh, and um, uh, and, and uh, so we, we, the scope of work really has them to, they have the technical expertise and the, and the contracted time uh, to pull together this mapping of our, of our uh, potential resources. Um, and, uh, and then through these scenarios, look at, you know, if, if, the, if the, uh, the ECAC or the, our committee, uh, but more so the town itself, uh, was to uh, suggest any amount of solar they think would be appropriate to host in, in the town, uh, well, what, what could that possibly look like in terms of uh, where it could go uh, how much land, uh, how, mu how much could fit on our built environment, uh, how much um, is, is, might be reasonable to, to think about on the unbuilt environment, uh, as well as um, uh, some differentiation about, you know, what that might mean in terms of cost and so forth associated with that solar development. Um, so I really feel like the technical assessment is, is, is just that. It's a technical um, uh, report and analysis uh, of um, of what the potentials are of solar in various forms around the around the the town, um, and um, it, it's it's really there to inform um, our committees uh, as well as the the town staff and the town council and the town manager uh, on um, uh, to be able to scope this whole concept out in terms of of how we should move forward with solar planning for the for the town. So I I would still ask that the scope of work. You know, bring our committee's work a little bit more to the forefront, so we're not kind of just showing up at the end. That the it would be great for us to meet with the consultant, but um, sort of following up on what Jack had asked uh, or said at the last meeting, I wonder if you know it seems like that technical report could be done. I'm not saying think quickly, but first, and then that report could come to us, ECAC. And then be part of that, you know, so we could look at that and then start the community information process because everyone's going to know what can go where and how much, you know, and and so it seems like if the if the assessment can come to us and the town and ECAC and staff, you know, that would be part one. And the next part is the community engagement process, which I really do think it'd be great for us to work with them on that, because I think. You know, because we live in the town, we we have all sorts of different people we can plug into and resources. But I do, I was like sort of Jack's question is how quickly can we get that assessment done, which is technical and based on the mapping and um, you know town bylaws and you know is this chapter is this APR land and stuff like that. Can we get that in a month or two or two months and then take a moment look at that and then start a community process saying here's the information and you know there's prices to pay for different scenarios or you know positive goals that places we could reach so that that's i'm wondering if jack's idea could be let's do the assessment quickly and then do the community process as a group together Let, let's hear from jack first and then we can um uh see if, if um we can um address his thoughts as well yeah, I, I'm, I don't really have any thoughts. I'm just, I understand that we are seeing this 
RFP for the first time and all that. But I just I thought that we kind of went over a lot of this last time as Stephanie went into quite detail about how you know consultants are usually interfacing with the professionals in our in our town hall there, Chris Restrooms group and things like that, you know, and we've never really interacted with on the planning board consultants directly. And I'm just I just felt like we went over a lot of this last meeting. And I'm just wondering how efficient we're being with some of this. <laughs> but um, again, I, I agree with Janet that, you know, it seems to be, you know, we're not going to, it doesn't seem like we're going to make much progress until we get the solar assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be, uh, you know, more ideal to get it sooner than later. Um, but anyway, I just, I'm not interested in, in you know, interviewing consultants or anything like that. I oh, mean, no. Technical product and and like Dwayne said, you know, we can dig in afterward and use it as a tool as we you know push our uh, the bylaw and associated planning document or planning map with us. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Stephanie. So I'm I'm sorry because I do feel like I'm repeating myself um, again, but the managers of the consultant are the town staff and the town manager. And the consultant will have the opportunity to meet with both the Solar Bylaw Working Group okay. and the ECAC. And it's expressly in the timeline that Duane has put together that the consultant will come meet with you, I believe, at two points, as Duane stated, at the beginning and at the end. The beginning will probably be to be able to talk about that community engagement piece and towards the end will be when they sort of have a draft to review and input on before everything is finalized. You're not the only, yes, it's important for the work that you're doing, but there's also other departments in town that this will impact. There's also other um, committees that will want to weigh in. So there's going to be a very broad process of an opportunity for other groups and other folks to weigh in. But ECAC and Solar Bylaw Working Group are specifically going to have the opportunity to meet with the consultant, which other committees won't necessarily to do other than the broader public engagement process. How we often work with getting other departments to weigh in is either staff will schedule a meeting with all of the department heads, which is what we did with the Climate Action Plan, or we will reach out to all of the department heads, get send them any documentation, draft documentation or initial engagement output that we feel they need to weigh in on. For instance, we will wanna reach out to the DEI director, um, Pamela, to get her input on the community engagement process. Um, and we will then take that information and convey that to the consultant. So there's a broader, there's a much broader process beyond just what this committee is doing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you will have opportunity. They are going to meet with you. They are expressly going to meet with you and the ECAC at least once, if not twice during their process. But it can't be more than that because they do have the bigger work that they're doing with the community engagement as well. And funds are limited. I mean, we don't have the ability to have you work directly with them throughout the whole process because we don't have the funds for that. So, um, you know, they'll they'll be working through a lot of what your input might be. They may meet with you initially and then additional feedback might come through staff. So we will give you drafts, we will give you information, we will ask you for your feedback and then it will come through staff and go to the staff will work with the contractor to incorporate your feedback. I hope that clarifies this. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I presume during that time frame, we'll probably have an agenda item uh, on each of our meetings to uh, get an update again on, on the work in progress and uh, and provide uh, any feedback to Stephanie and, and Chris that can then be related to the consultant. Okay, uh, anything else on th that is a staff update, uh, extended staff update and, and uh, solar assessment update, Stephanie? No, I think that's Great. fine. Okay. Um, Chris, how about if we first, any any staff updates first, and then we'll, we'll move into your um, 
more prepared uh, remarks or whatever on the on the land use. Yeah, so I, I just have two um, updates, and one is that um, now that Nate Malloy is back from vacation, he's back working on the scope um, for the consultant who's going to help us with um, drafting of the solar bylaw. So he's um, he hasn't put it out yet, but it it will come out soon. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, based on our conversation last time we met, um, we talked about trying to get input from uh, KP Law, which is our town council, S-E-L. Um, and <laughs> we have made contact with um, an attorney at KP Law and uh, Dwayne and Stephanie and I will be having a conversation with him on Friday about um, some of the questions that we have that we would like him to address when he does come and present to you. And we're imagining that the presentation would be sometime in September or October where um, he comes and you know, tries to give us guidance on what can and can't be included in a solar bylaw. Okay. Great, yeah, thank you. And I, I thought the conversation last week or la uh, last meeting uh, and uh, who was it, Laura, I think uh, provided that sort of um, update on, on some of the tech uh, legal issues uh, was very helpful to hear that, uh, which can then help us uh, uh, develop a, a um, set of questioning questions uh, for the uh, for the KP Law Council. <laughs> Great, thank you, Chris. Um, any comments on that before we uh, move on to the next agenda item? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, next um, is, is is Chris again uh, to give us a um, uh, an, an overview of, of of land use and mapping in Amherst, um, and appreciate uh, really you taking the time uh, on on this, Chris. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to. I'm very nervous right now because I've never only <laughs> once have I successfully shared my screen. So I'm going to try to share my screen, <laughs> and if I fail miserably, then Stephanie will step in. Um, but I believe I have the document open, so I'm going to hit share screen, and then I'm going to find my document, which is, was open. Now, where is it? Hmm. Chris, Pamela, when you need her, Chris. Chris, check your yeah. banner at the top. Check your banner. banner. There we go. Yes, banner. Am I still here? Yep. Yes, and just and then hit share it at is. the bottom right. I see, yeah. And then, all right. Now, can I minimize this? Then I hit share. There you go. Seems to be is working. That, are you seeing what I... No, yeah. we're seeing your see. desktop. Yeah, we're seeing your whole screen, which is um, maybe, maybe okay. Maybe more maybe. than you want to more, see. More than we want. So you might want to stop share. Stop share. There you go. All right, let's try that again. Okay, so I have this document Indeed. open. There it is. So I click, click on that on the document. document and All then right. share. And then there should be in the bottom right, there's the share button. Here it is. Okay, and then I go here and now you can see it. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to be um, going home and bragging to my family that I did this today. <laughs> okay. They probably so, won't be very impressed. <laughs> they won't be. No. <laughs> All right. This is a map that is part of the master plan. And um, I'm going to introduce myself to people who are out there in the audience. I'm Chris Brestrup, the planning director. And I want to give you an overview on land use in Amherst. And this is the best map that I could find that really kind of puts it all in one place. Um, the map is entitled Physical Form and Character, and it was prepared in 2007 as part of the work on the master plan. It shows in general how land use is done or how it exists in Amherst. And there are a few small errors here and there and some changes that haven't been made to reflect um, new land uses, but basically it shows, um, generally speaking, how we use land in Amherst. Um, to let you know, the map is available on the town website. If you go to the planning board page, and then over on the left-hand side, there's an opportunity to click on map.
I can't hear Chris. Yeah, I think um, she got uh, frozen and I, Stephanie maybe as well. So maybe it's a town hall thing. I did want people to know also while we wait for Chris, uh, this was also in our packet, this map. Uh, and so um, I, I suspect that means it's also in the folder of our working group so people can access it there as well. Oops. Okay. Okay. Back. Am I back again? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, Sorry but about we that. lost your we lost your shared screen. Lost my screen. Ah. Chris, would you like me no. to just open it? Sure. And then you're going to have to help me when when I point out places. So. Okay. Or right. when? It, well, I'll do my best. All right. Um, I could try this again. Try, try again, again and see. I'm not sure why we lost. It, were you are disconnected, Stephanie, too? Yes, I was okay. knocked out, so. Huh. Isn't that strange? So I clicked on the map, and I minimized it. Then I'm here in, I'm afraid I'm, I'm just going to have to go with Stephanie. Stephanie, okay. you're, you're my ticket. Okay. To, Bear with me one moment. I, I had a brief success. Okay. okay, here's the map. Maybe I tried to move it, so that wasn't a good idea, was it? Um, so anyway, these orange circles, faint orange circles, they represent the downtown. And the let's see, um, Stephanie was just pointing to North Amherst. So there um, is the downtown and village centers. So there's the downtown that Stephanie's pointing to. And other village centers include just to the east of that is the East Amherst Village Center. So Stephanie, you can put your cursor around um, an, an orange circle to the east. To the south is um, Pomeroy Village Center at Pomeroy Lane. Can you get uh, down to that step? Mm -hmm. um, and the South Amherst Common where the Munson Library is located and the church. And then Atkins Corner over, uh, yes, there's Atkins Corner Village Center. It really, um, you know, primarily consists of Atkins Market. And then in the north part of Amherst, if Stephanie could scroll up, um, there are uh, two village centers. One is the North Amherst Village Center that's at the intersection of Pine Street, Meadow Street, and um, North Pleasant Street. And then a little village center over to the east is Cushman Village Center. And that centers around um, some housing there and the railroad track and the um, Cushman store. So these areas already have a significant amount of development. <clears throat> and the master plan states that we should direct future development into already developed areas and preserve our outlying areas for farming, forests, and recreation as much as possible. On this map, the olive green areas represent existing protected spaces in town, and a lot of it is open space. These areas could be farms, forests, or recreation lands. Many of the farms are protected by what we call APRs, which are agri agricultural protection restrictions. So these APRs represent areas where the landowner has agreed not to develop the land in perpetuity and has made an agreement with the state and the town to refrain from developing. And in return, the landowner receives a one-time payment and puts his land into an APR. So those are areas that can't be built on in the future except for farm buildings and things like that. Some of these olive green areas are owned by the town, such as the area around Puffer's Pond. I wonder if Stephanie could scroll down and um, find that. Puffer's Pond is sort of to the east of North Amherst. There, she, you just mm -hmm. swish, swished by it. It's towards the top of the page. Yep. Yeah, there it is, Puffer's Pond. So we own areas around Puffer's Pond that are in conservation. We also have the Mill River Conservation Area and the Cherry Hill Golf Course, which is a big piece of land up there in North Amherst. So those are preserved as either conservation or recreation lands. Then, as you notice on this map, we have cross-hatched areas. And those are 
considered to be chapter lands. And what that means is that they're temporarily protected. Um, they're lands for which the landowner has made an agreement with the town not to develop the land in exchange for reduced real estate taxes for a period of time. And those chapter lands are considered in three categories. The period of time is about five years usually. So he puts his land into chapter 61, which is forest land, chapter 61A, which is agriculture, or chapter 61B, which is recreation, and then gets a reduction in taxes for a period of five years. If the landowner wants to take his land out of chapter, um, he needs to pay the back taxes to the town. And at the time that the uh, landowner requests to take the land out of chapter, um, the town then has a right of first refusal to purchase the parcel. And if the town fe feels that it's a worthwhile purchase, then the town um, has the land assessed or, or excuse me, appraised. And then usually there's a purchase and sale agreement. The owner might have a purchase and sale agreement with a potential buyer. And that number is used as the purchase price for the property. So then the town would have to find the money to purchase the property if they decide to do that. Um, so these lands um, need to be acquired at fair market value, which is essentially what I just said. Uh, the areas shown in gray, and there are large areas shown in gray, are the institutional properties. And these are um, UMass, which is right there in the center of the screen. It's a really pretty big um, uh, array of land. Um, then we have Ham Am Amherst College, which is closer to downtown, and they also own quite a bit of land. And some of the chapter land that is um, south of the gray area also has a cross hatching on it. So those are lands that Amherst College owns, but they also have a chapter uh, designation on them, some of those lands. Um, let's see what else. Um, and then we have, of course, Hampshire College down in South Amherst, and they own a whole lot of property down in, in South Amherst. Uh, these are generally speaking in the educational zoning district. And so the town has um, limited uh, ability to control what goes on in those properties. Um, the properties shown in red, and if Stephanie would scroll back up so we could see the downtown area again, the areas shown in red are mostly areas where a significant amount of commercial development has already occurred. Um, there's downtown Amherst, there's the area along University Drive where um, the Big Y shopping plaza is. Um, there's the farmer's supply along um, the rail trail in the center of town. It's just to the east of downtown. Um, let's see, East Amherst Village Center is also there where Kelly's Restaurant and Spirit House is. There's area down in South Amherst, Atkins Farms Market, and in North Amherst, the North Square at the Mill District. So that's that's South Amherst, and then North Square at the Mill District is where um, there was a, a recently a housing development that was built up there. So those are areas that we consider um, really the heavily developed areas in town. There are also lesser developed areas, um, and they're shown in pink on this map, and they represent lands that are available for business or commercial uses, but may not be as heavily developed as the red areas. And some of these places include um, the area along Route 9, which is between Route 9 and the rail trail. Um, that's where Greenleaves is located. And there's also a mixed use building that's being built there now. You've probably noticed it. Barry Roberts is building a building and it's going to have eye physicians of Northampton there eventually, but it's a mixed use building and it's got um, dwelling units in it. Um, there's also a bit of land um, near Fort River School which is in the eastern part of Amherst. And that area includes Watson Farms, um, affordable housing development, and Amherst Glass is also there. And the Amherst uh, Jewish Community Center is there. So those are places that are somewhat developed, but not heavily developed. Um, there's another area along Belchertown Road that um, is a pink area towards, as you go towards Pelham, that's right. and. There we have Valley Medical, the Stavros building, Dr. Kate Atkinson's building on Research Drive, and there are some parcels of land in that area that are available for development. Um, there's a pink area around Pomeroy Village Center, 
and that's at the intersection of 116 and Pomeroy Village, Pomeroy Lane rather, um, over towards the western part of town. Uh, that's right, that's where it is. Um, and this is a, a place where the roundabout is going to be built. There's already a fair amount of development there, including Mission Cantina and other businesses that we often uh, go to. Um, and then in North Amherst along Sunderland Road, there's a, a pink area up north of where North Square is. And along Sunderland Road, there's quite a bit of land that's available for development. It's um, zoned PRP or Professional Research Park. So north of the village center is, is what I'm talking about. Um, so those are kind of areas where we've earmarked for um, future development. The white areas, and many of the white areas are also densely built on, um, that's where most of the housing, single family housing in Amherst exists. So we have um, <clears throat> Echo Hill, which is over on the east, um, which is my favorite place because I live there. Um, it's on the eastern border of town. Um, if Stephanie can, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, right in there is Echo Hill. We also have Pelham Road, Jenks Street, and that area. So that's you know relatively heavily developed for housing. Um, <clears throat> we also have Orchard Valley on the east or west side of town. Um, it's down near Pomeroy Village. Um, so if Stephanie would scroll up a bit, um, Pomeroy Village is just um, right there, that pink area, but to the southwest of that is Orchard Valley, which is a heavily developed um, housing area. Um, and we have Amherst Hills, which is going is in the process of being developed in Amherst Woods. We have an area around the high school. So there are a lot of areas in town that are already heavily developed for single family homes. Other areas shown in white include areas that could be developed, but many of them have wetlands or lack of town sewer and water. So it's a challenge for developers to develop them. Um, so in conclusion, I guess the point that I wanted to get across here is that there's not a lot of developable land left in Amherst. Many of the farms and uh, forests are already preserved and the institutions own a significant amount of the land which they may or may not choose to develop. So this map shows existing land uses and constraints on land uses in town. And those will limit our ability to find suitable places in town for large round mounted solar arrays. And um, so now with the permission of the chair, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, permission certainly granted, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Janet? I wanted to make one comment, first of all, which is that we don't have officially designated village centers. And so these are sort of like what we think is village centers. And I really have never been able to understand why Cushman Village with one store is a village center. And there's like a, I think there's a, a preschool there. Um, and then also on South Common near me, which is, you know, a church next to the Munson. And so surrounded by houses and protected land. So those two have never made sense to me, and I totally, I do totally support sending um, dense development towards what the existing village centers that actually already have commercial stuff. So I just wanted to sort of say that that designation, I would love us to do as a town officially, but we just never have to do. But I do have questions for Chris, and then a request to look at, um, like, I don't know if we have a map. I have a map that's a little bit different, showing kind of like the Lawrence Swamp area in the Fort River, like give us a you know, a sense of more of the um, um, natural resources of the area, but I want to push that aside. I have two questions for you. Um, when when we were looking when we're looking at the protected open space, which is the olive green portions, do those prevent any solar development because they're through some state program, or is it a mix? And then the second question I have is: Will the consultant be looking at educational lands? and like the Eversource right away. Cause there, I think there's a ton of open space on all the campuses that could be for solar. So I hope that doesn't get taken away from the consultant. So those are two questions. You know, what are the olive green off the map for solar because of state requirements or is it a mix? May I answer that? Yes, please. So I understand that um, these properties that have restrictions on them, APRs and conservation restrictions, they each have um, their own set of restrictions, but in general, they are not open to development. I would be very surprised if they would be 
um, available for solar development? I think I've asked that question of uh, people in the office here and they've said definitely not with APRs. Um, yeah. And then the conservation restrictions, Stephanie may be able to answer that more fully because she works in the conservation department. But my understanding is anything that has a restriction on it really wouldn't be available. The lands that have uh, chapter designations certainly could be available for um, development for solar. And okay. as far as um, will the consultant look at the ED zoning district, I don't know if that's something that um, Stephanie had in mind when she wrote the scope of work for this consultant. So that would be something to ask Stephanie. So um, we didn't have any, um, we basically wanted them to look at where is solar possible okay. in town. So um, those parcels that do have APRs or conservation restrictions are absolutely off limits. Okay. Um, I don't think we had the we didn't have the conversation about the educational. And again, this is something that has to be refined when we get a consultant on board, um, and to see what the town, uh, you know, what the the town feels is the the best um, approach. You know, we can't presume that the the colleges may have already had their own assessments, actually. Um, so we might actually ask the consultant to reach out to the colleges mm -hmm. and the university and ask if they would share what they have identified for solar development. So they may not because um, I, in fact, I know that they've had assessments done on their own. And then that's a, and then Doug Marshall had suggested the Eversource right of way, which I've been walking my dog on, um, which is all cleared land and right next to transmission lines, but not, you know, with the actual um, ability to, you know, just put a wire into it. And I just, it seems like a huge swath that has to be kept open. And so I would love to have the consultant look at that too. So if, if we can, you know, again, because there's utility, I don't know that. Yeah, Dwayne probably yeah. has more experience with that from working in other communities. Well, actually, the the, <clears throat> the question from other communities has come up. Why don't we put in in uh, electric uh, transmission, particularly uh, rights of way? So, just at the Clean Energy Extension, we did uh, dig into that a bit, um, and because uh, it seemed like a no brainer to some extent. Yeah. Uh, that being said. Um, <laughs> There, there are issues uh, uh, with regard to rules and regulations of the utility company. Uh, but furthermore, uh, and this comes from some research from other parts of the of the world as well, in Europe as I think, and elsewhere, there are some some um, real issues associated with um, interface between the um, transmission lines and any solar. Uh, the workings of the solar technically uh, being that close to mm. the, um, I guess it's EMF coming from the um, from the transmission lines, that close. Uh, there, there's there's guidelines with regard to how far back solar arrays. This is not a guideline from the state or from the federal government, but just from researchers of how far back it needs to be to not interface with the electric uh, activities of the solar cells. Um, and um, it's remarkably fairly far, so it really limits that amount of, of, of space that would be available. Uh, that being said, um, to, to uh, have, a, have the consultant uh, opine on that, um, I think is something um, uh, that we could, could consider uh, if it could fit into the scope of work in the budget. One thing I will say is that just from my background experience as the former wetlands administrator, I know that, you know, the, the reason why it's so open is because it's meant to be to provide 24-7 access to those transmission lines should there be an outage or other event that they need to access them. So having mm -hmm. solar panels directly underneath, to me, would prove to be an obstruction to access, which is probably why they're not sited right on directly underneath. Okay. Okay, great. And there are all kinds of exemptions in state laws to allow them for that because it's, you know, a public benefit. Thank you. 
Great. I thought, uh, Chris, thank you very much for that. I, I would agree with, um, and I think it is a different question than what we're asking Chris to do here, uh, but certainly something the consultant uh, will be looking at is, is the issue of, uh, okay, you know, as, as, as I think we recognize from this map, um, there's a lot of land in Amherst that's not, that can't be used for solar, uh, which is great. We treasure that open land and, and uh, the conservation restrictions we have. Um, and, um, uh, and then if we, in addition, overlay uh, wetlands uh, and so forth, that's going to further, I mean, some of that will be on the already con uh, conserved areas, but it'll take away even more of the white areas, I presume. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, maybe the consultant will have a pretty easy time with this, uh, uh, but, um, uh, but it's going to leave, you know, th these are, are um, uh, so, um, I think that's that's uh, is sort of a takeaway from from the presentation. But I think it's it's um, uh, will come later with regard to overlaying uh, other um, uh, environmental layers like wetlands and and um, uh, uh, habitat of of uh, rare species and so forth. Um, Jack, yeah, I just wanted to confirm uh, with regard to solar underneath the the high tension wires that there's. Uh, are there any solar fields that you're aware of, like in the Northeast, that are situated in that sense? Because um, it, it sounds it does sound great, like like you know was mentioned, but I think you know it has to meet the straight face test for us to really even pursue it. And you're looking at a big you know landowner and, and utility you know and, and Eversource and, and National Grid and things like that. But are, are you aware of any? Solar fields underneath high tension wires in that in that uh, in, in the conceptual manner that we we're talking about. Um, me personally, no. Um, and in fact, I, th I think I would know if there was at least in the Northeast because we had a student sort of dig into this uh, as a literature review, and I'm, I'm confident he would have uh, um, found that. Um, uh, so you know, I, and I asked the student to look at it because. Um, you know, it's a little bit different than it was maybe five or 10 years ago. Now we're talking about this real um, uh, constraint of, of solar and land use. So, you know, it, it, I, I, um, if, the, if the utilities don't want it just because they don't want to deal with it, uh, then it's time to reassess that. <laughs> um, uh, because, you know, if we don't put it there, it means it's somewhere in the world, if not in the Commonwealth, some, something else needs to be cleared away and cut down to, to put up that array uh, or that capacity. Uh, so, um, uh, but I, th I think there are real technical issues uh, that really um, limit, limit that opportunity. I, I, I do wonder whether the uh, state, uh, the state's going through a technical assessment as well as, as uh, uh, Stephanie mentioned. Um, and I'm wondering if that's on their radar uh, as well. Um, I'm not sure. It may be just a clear no. I okay. mean, to me, it just raises safety issues is my, yeah. you know, that, that to me is the primary um, barrier, I would think, because that's high voltage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ab absolutely. Um, there's a, there's a, definitely safety issues and, and the need for the utility company to get there, get to points along those lines in a, in a moment. So similar issues occur when you're talking about solar along um, highways and median strips, um, well, that also looks like good opportunities. There's good reason why those medium strips are uh, have unobstructed uh, uh, grassy grassy areas um, uh, because it's a safety issue uh, and, and a safety desire. Okay, any additional questions for Chris? Great, this is really helpful. And I, I was gonna mention, I think when Chris was uh, frozen, uh, I did mention that this map uh, as well as some other uh, information was in our packet. Uh, and so in addition to maybe digging it out of the planning department, I think that it's also in our packet. And for that reason, Stephanie will be in our folder uh, on the um, for our sub uh, working group as well. It's, it's in your, it's already in your meeting packet and it's in the resource folder. Yeah, okay, so that might be an easier place Online. to find it find it than um, uh, uh, Chris's um, 
place to find it in the planning department. All right, great. Okay, good. Uh, we're about halfway through, uh, which looks good. Um, and so um, why don't we turn to uh, Martha uh, for the next agenda item, uh, which is basically providing a, 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 an overview of the um, uh, of, of the uh, decarb the state uh, Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap, and um, Martha did put a presentation together. And did did you want me to share that, Martha? Um, well, let me see if I do any okay. uh, any okay. luck better than Chris at okay. uh, at doing this here. Okay, let's see. I have it teed up just in case. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's see. And let's try to. Um, Stick to about half an hour uh, on those uh, 20, uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. It is about half an hour, so let's yeah. see. Slideshow. Slideshow. And um, then at the top? Yes, yes. The top. Because, unfortunately, what's happened right now is the little bar that says, oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Play from start. There, there we go. go. Okay. Cool. Let's, let's see how it works. All right. So I just want to give them a, a high-level overview of the 2050 decarbonization roadmap and then discuss the clean energy and climate plan for the near term that just came out two years ago and the updates and the goals in that. Mm -hmm. So as you know, uh, Governor Baker committed Massachusetts to a target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And what that means is at a minimum, an 85% reduction compared to 1990, 1990 being used as the base level here. And net zero means that emissions equal subtractions, so that if there's residual emissions, has to be balanced by the amount of carbon sequestration, that is the amount of CO2 that's actually removed from the atmosphere each year. So that's the, the definition of net zero. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, several basic documents. There were several technical reports that were written in 2020 to support the Massachusetts decarbonation roadmap. And so as I identified with the red, red dot, the one that's called Energy Pathways to Deep Decarbonization is really the technical report that analyzes and asks the question, is this goal feasible? And does various analytic studies uh, with various scenarios and so on. So that's what I really uh, have read and wanted to focus on here. Mm -hmm. So first let's have a look at what is the annual greenhouse gas emissions. And so this is a plot then from 2005 up through 2017. And as you can see, the biggest contribution to greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts by far and away is transportation. All the fossil fuel being used to run our cars, buses, uh, and so on. And next after that comes buildings, that is, Many buildings, maybe the majority, still use uh, oil heat or other fossil fuel heating and other fossil fuel for other uses, water heat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then the electricity, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, as you can see, has been declining now for years. And that's due mainly to the closure of coal-fired plants, oil-fired plants, if they to some extent been converted to natural gas and then renewable uh, electricity generation is slowly but surely increasing. But it's important to note that that yellow line that's decreasing steadily is not a decrease in use of electricity. It's only a decrease in the emissions that come out. And actually the use of electricity is rising and will rise uh, substantially as time goes on. And then the non industry energy and industrial are sort of the miscellaneous things, the methane leaks, the municipal waste incinerators, the, um, you know, they don't mention it, but making cement uh, or uh, other industrial uses and so on. So, so then just to review the, the numbers again, 
is transportation is by far and away the highest, almost half, then buildings, and then the electricity generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the areas then, and so this analytic report then looks at each one of those sectors to say, well, you know, what are the goals, what are the strategies to, to do something about? And so the first basic thing is to increase energy efficiency, and that comes out of every study being done by any organization. Our League of Women Voters did that a decade ago. Uh, the more you can re increase energy efficiency, say particularly then in buildings and so on, uh, the, the better you're going to be. And then the next important, very important aspect is to electrify the end use technologies. And that means electrifying vehicles, bus fleets and so on, and electrifying uh, home heating and, and so on. And then you come to further decarbonizing the electricity generation is where solar panels come in. And then fourth and also important then is, is carbon capture uh, what we said about Net zero means balancing emissions and subtractions. Um, so here then in a little chart, we have that, what the, what the, the technical report and roadmap are called the, the pillars of decarbonization. And so the goals would be then, whoops, excuse me, hi, <laughs> good. Uh, the goals would be that uh, first of all, say take, uh, Automobiles should be electrified. And so Massachusetts already is uh, stating that after 2035, only electric vehicles will be sold in Massachusetts. Uh, now the pace of how that progresses depends of course on a lot of things. It depends on people. How fast do you really want to spend money uh, to buy a fancy new electric vehicle? Also their technology, maybe pretty soon all the electric cars will have solar panels on the roofs uh, and hopefully also improved uh, batteries. The batteries currently are quite heavy, hopefully maybe better technology, lighter weight, more efficient and so on. Uh, then the energy efficiency and then also electrification of buildings is certainly significant and this you know, this is discussed in our town's uh, climate action plan and so on, that uh, energy efficiency and so on means uh, retrofitting existing buildings and the, the, the codes, the green codes for new buildings. We see that here in Amherst with the discussion of the new elementary school and how it's going to be done. And then decarbonizing the energy supply, uh, that's wind energy, solar panels, uh, hydro, uh, et cetera. And finally, the fourth pillar then is sequestration and um, uh, how, how we do that and how we can balance. So, well, let's see there. So then this technical report uh, considered eight different pathways to analyze. And this was a process that actually was begun in California and several states are now doing that to sort of analyze, take different scenarios of what would happen if you made different sets of assumptions and can you still get there and what would it cost? Uh, and so I was impressed with the details of the analysis, but also they cautioned that these are not forecasts. There's a certain set of assumptions. There was really no effort to try to project what new technology might do in any concrete way. So the all options, the basic benchmark uh, concludes that yes, it's feasible and not horrendously expensive that you can get there from here. Then if you if you limit offshore wind, which was, we'll see is really a big uh, uh, thing, uh, then they really are stressed to provide enough clean power. And they suggest that uh, maybe in fact, one would have to consider then also having nuclear uh, power generation. Uh, and similarly, if you limited efficiency, if you didn't really work hard to get your buildings efficient and uh, improve the efficiency of storage batteries and transmission, it would be difficult. Okay, so the next 
set here. Uh, and again, as you see, they went through various other scenarios. I'd uh, like to uh, mention the final one called distributed energy resources breakthrough. And that is uh, considering you know, more small distributed units and what we call behind the meter, that is uh, things that are really uh, locally generated for buildings and so on. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. So this was the basic uh, technical aspects then that kind of uh, buttressed and supported the basic 2050 decarbonization roadmap. There. Martha, I'm sorry, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't understand the distributed energy resources. I don't yeah, know I'll, I'll get that to that in a couple of slides. Okay, okay. That's okay. just uh, yeah. so, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, and so New England has a regional grid. We're all tied in together also with uh, bordering parts of New York State and Canada. And each one of these areas has uh, come up with emission targets for reduction. Some of the problems are that our New England has a high population density. And so that uh, is challenging. We have large winter heating loads, which of course gives a big peak uh, to, to the uh, draw on energy that you need at a time when say solar panels are not you know, producing so much. We have a large offshore wind potential. The, the area south of, of Cape Cod out in the continental shelf is considered a world-class wind field. And certainly Massachusetts is emphasizing that. The governor and the legislature see that as a huge win for our economy and jobs and so on. That uh, they conclude we have moderate solar resource quality and we have significant tie-in with the uh, hydroelectric system, mainly the one up in Canada, Hydro-Quebec, and that this is seen as a real kind of buffer and sort of a steady backup uh, against the sort of the variable fluxes in both wind energy and solar energy. And also then they looked at that there's no real regional possibilities for what you'd call geological sequestration that is, you know, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and you know, somehow storing it in uh, geological formations that really uh, sequestration depends on our natural open lands. Mm -hmm. And so their model results then in terms of the electricity generation is that the offshore wind is the most important. And uh, they give a, a minimum estimate for offshore wind. They're using the past tense because it refers to their models, but obviously it's talking about the future. Uh, and then in the cases where the wind dies down or you know there's big delays, then really the hydro from Quebec is used to make up the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the solar photovoltaics uh, they project would make up 25 to 30 percent of the electricity generation and uh, limited by the cost of storing and, and shifting in the, in the times, the day, night times and so on. They also emphasize that rooftop solar can be quite significant. And uh, although both rooftop and ground mounted are definitely needed, the more that could be done with the solar rooftop, uh, the less land use that would be required for ground mounted solar. And the final estimate was that the share of final energy delivered in 2050 would be 68%, uh, which is a factor of three and a half times our levels of today. Okay, so now the behind the meter, the distributed energy here. Uh, and they, they emphasize that, um, Let's see. Let, let's see. Yeah, that uh, energy production and storage uh, systems, such as photovoltaics, that can directly supply homes and buildings with electricity before passing through the meter and onto the grid, uh, are significant and are an interesting development with what they see as a lot of potential. And that's what they meant by their direct 
distributed energy resources breakthrough was the was upgrading the technology there for particularly say for storage systems. It has an advantage that you're generating the power at your point of use. Uh, if if many buildings, if not most, uh, could be powered themselves by solar panels and then have storage systems um, with with that. Uh, that could be a, a real uh, plus. It also then would uh, sort of decrease to some extent the loads necessary for the transmission grid. However, they mean that uh, such behind the meter systems would still mainly uh, be connected to the grid so that energy could flow both ways. It's not, they're not talking about off grid and so on. And then uh, when they, did their best estimates, uh, they found that the if you could really strongly encourage rooftop installation and, and the built environment, you can significantly reduce uh, land requirements, but you still need both in order to reach the net zero goals. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. So challenges then in, gen in just the general overview would be uh, places to site renewables, both wind and solar due to high population density and the expense of land parcels. We've seen from Chris that there's not huge amounts of obvious availability here in Amherst. And then there's problems with siting upgraded tra electrical transmission lines for the same reasons. And, and as some of you may be aware, there's a real problem uh, for Massachusetts with uh, contracts with the Hydro Quebec because transmission lines have to come across northern New England and uh, both New Hampshire and Maine uh, have sort of challenged the ability of, of, of having above ground transmission lines uh, march through their state to get to us. Mm -hmm. And also then there's the problems that wind, solar, uh, hydro, the generation is not located near the end users, except for the distributed small scale systems, uh, which again is problems you need uh, really to upgrade the whole transmission system. And we have the potential for extreme weather events, both in terms of, you know, high winds, hurricanes, and floods that can destroy equipment, but also then extreme heat spells in the summer and extreme cold spells in the winter that really shift the peak loads. And there's a problem with the renewables of balancing the times of peak loads versus the times of peak production. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of a high level overview then of the sort of the analyses that went into the basic uh, 2050 uh, roadmap. And so now I'll turn and talk about the latest updates here, the clean energy and climate plan for the near term, uh, which was just published in late June. And so this document sets specific goals for 2025 and 2030 and describes strategies to reach the goals for each sector. And in contrast to the original decarbonization roadmap, there's a lot more emphasis on carbon sequestration and preserving natural and working lands. I think that sort of the recognition that getting to zero emissions in 2050, 100% zero emissions is probably not going to happen. And so if you are at you know, 85%, 80%, whatever, you really need to balance it with the carbon sequestration. And of course, climate research has, uh, in recent years, has shown that it's not going to be enough just to cut our emissions, uh, emissions that we really have to increase the amount of um, CO2 drawdown. So looking again then at these um, emissions, we saw that transportation was the high one. It hadn't decreased very much. Um, whoops, whoops, there we go. And uh, then the buildings and the electricity uh, at the moment, uh, the uh, amount of emissions is gone way down, but we have to recognize that, and that electricity use is going to go way up. So now I'm showing you 
in a, in a different form here. This is sort of the same thought, but this is really the crux of the whole thing. So I want to spend some time on this particular plot. So here is the plot of the greenhouse gas emissions starting from 1990, which is our reference year, all the way out to 2030, which is the end goal uh, for this latest report. And again, you see the sectors uh, that transportation is the largest sector, and then comes buildings, and then electricity, certainly from 1990 to about 2010, was significantly high. And it was starting really in the 2010 that the coal-fired plants and so on and the highest polluting plants have been decreasing all the way down. <laughs> and then uh, the report is very proud to say that we reached our 2020 goals, which is that first little diamond there for 2020. But if you look closely, you really see why and you note the transportation and you see the abrupt drop in the transportation emissions in 2019 to 2020. And I think we can all conclude why that might be, that it might have something to do with a certain COVID virus uh, that was really decreasing uh, transportation. And so, you know, maybe the true line would be a little more uh, gradual there. <laughs> but you can also see then if you look ahead to 2025 and 2030, you have to decrease the emissions from transportation and buildings. It's not enough just to say, oh, we're going to uh, totally eliminate uh, the emissions uh, from the electricity sector. You really have to concentrate on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And again, recognize that then the electricity uh, draw will be going up. So then just to summarize their goals, uh, the 25% reduction, they say it was met. And for 2025, a 33% reduction from 1990. And by 2030, which is not so far away, the, they, the goal is to have the greenhouse gas emissions 50% lower than 1990. So transportation, uh, as they state in the report, the way they see to get there, is you have to reduce the growth of vehicle miles, about, mainly in private vehicles, by improving public transportation. And so you need to add bus service and convert to all electric fleets of buses and so on. Just read in the paper today about uh, you know Boston's uh, MTA and the uh, Governor Baker's new. Uh, uh, funding to help improve that system. Then the transition to electric vehicles, that's for particularly for passenger cars and then, you know, buses and any other kind of uh, vehicle fleets and so on. And this is going to take time. You know, it's not something that everybody's going to rush out and buy their electrical vehicle next year. Uh, as you can uh, imagine, it's going to be over you know, a decade, two decades before we really uh, get there, that's say my view. And uh, then along with that, the state is committing to improving the infrastructure for electric vehicle charging. So that there's uh, you know, more, many more uh, stations in there. And so you see there's the goals for uh, 2025 and 30. And so then buildings uh, really have to focus on improving energy efficiency. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, the mass save kinds of things, but uh, specifically then electrifying the heating systems. And that means uh, primarily then heat pumps. Uh, they're not talking about geothermal yet, because I'd say because the that technology is, is still under development. Uh, in a few years, we may be able to really talk seriously about that. Uh, but the, this is the most important thing to do for the short term, really. That's where you get the biggest benefits is to electrify buildings and, and reduce their emissions. And uh, part of what the state is doing then is uh, 
enhancing the building codes for new buildings. We see evidence of that then in, uh, in Amherst. And then the uh, state is going to be increasing the financial incentives for people to install uh, heat pumps, try to make it more attractive for that. Uh, so there's the goals, minus 28% and minus 47%. So it's ambitious goals. And it's what, what I think it's going to take is really uh, a lot of you know, proactive uh, emphasis uh, on doing this. So then electricity generation. So over the years, as the other sectors electrify, electricity demand is going to increase significantly, which means that the transmission and distribution systems need significant upgrades and increase capacity. And uh, Massachusetts has concluded that wind energy is going to be the dominant renewable. And the numbers I've heard, it's that uh, estimate of about 40% of our energy supply for electricity will come from the wind energy, mainly the offshore wind south of Cape Cod. And there have there are already two contracts that are signed and in place and work is starting. As I understand it, there's a third contract under negotiation and more coming so that the uh, our state government is taking this very seriously, both the legislature and the, and the governor. They see it as really significant for jobs and Massachusetts economy. And so that I, I think is one strong reason why they are emphasizing the wind energy. Uh, plus, if you can do it offshore, uh, you don't need the, the, the challenges of uh, getting uh, land to do it. Also then regarding solar, there is the new emphasis on rooftop solar, and that really is to help offset uh, the widespread uh, use of land for uh, solar panels that has to be you know, a balance. But again, I think they want to put some priorities and some financial incentives on doing uh, solar for rooftops and the built environment. And then the land conservation and has the new urgency. And so I'm just, I've included then uh, just a couple of verbatim statements from the document rather than trying to summarize and, and so here's their statement then on the solar, uh, that the two challenges are the interconnection of distributed energy resources and the impacts on natural and working lands. And again, the statement on the solar deployment that um, in order to balance it with the protection of natural and working lands that DOER will work closely with environmental protection agencies and stakeholders to uh, balance the incentives per, to provide it to solar and storage so that they do not unintentionally harm valuable and natural working lands and forests. <laughs> and DOER will encourage deploying solar and storage projects on built landscapes. Uh, and so they estimate that there could be 2 million systems installed on rooftops, lawns, fields, et cetera. Uh, so uh, th that is sort of the future over the next 10 years, I would say. And then again, a statement from the document about protecting our natural and working lands here. Uh, and their calculations have now been uh, done to, to analyze how much uh, our natural lands in Massachusetts currently store. So they've given a, a number here, six gigatons of carbon, which they say is equivalent to the past 25 years of greenhouse gas emissions in the Commonwealth. So this is not insignificant, uh, which is why they are now stressing the importance of preserving uh, the natural land. So let's look at here at the um, map of Massachusetts here. And so settled areas are in red. So that's about 25% of Massachusetts land area. And you see, obviously, it's concentrated in East Massachusetts, except that there we have you know, Springfield and Holyoke and uh, sort of the Pioneer Valley. 
And then forest land is almost 3 million acres or 57%. And it's concentrated, of course, in the Western half of the state. And there's wetlands and water that are about 10%. And then the crops and grassland is about 7%. And that surprised me. I mean, because we think of Massachusetts, at least I do, based on living here, of, of having extensive farmland and, and local produce and uh, so on, and local dairy industry. And yet it's very little and most of it uh, is concentrated right around us. And so I think when we are considering zoning and uh, what, we may write about agricultural land. I think we might want to give you know certain thought and focus to to what is best for our local agriculture. Yes. <laughs> so then, just to summarize that, the uh, forests are more than half of all our land area, and uh, the quarter is the settled part, and then we have a little bit of agriculture and some wetlands and water. So again, here is a statement then from the uh, document that uh, the importance of forests, both for carbon sequestration and then also for the other benefits that forests can produce. So I won't read the whole thing. Uh, and so one of the uh, statements then in this document is the Commonwealth is committing to the goal of increasing permanent conservation of undeveloped land and water, including wetlands. It's now, I think, 25% or 26%, and they want to increase it to 28% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. So that is a, a specific commitment that they want to, uh, to make looking at uh, our natural lands. Mm -hmm. And then this, this is just an interesting plot the ownership of permanently protected open land, the state owns somewhat less than half and municipalities own about a quarter. And then there's the uh, private areas, the description that uh, Chris was talking about and, and land trusts and, and so on. So the state is, is wanting to, to step up and increase the permanent protection of lands that are under uh, their domain. And then there's a bunch of additional goals that I'm not going to go into, but the plan does uh, itemize various things, including uh, planting urban trees uh, by the thousands. And uh, then overall, they are have analyzed uh, that natural lands do have some emissions as well as sequestration. And the goal is to reduce that uh, to the, 25% lower than uh, natural lands, yes. And so uh, just before closing, I, I do want to mention that uh, both the 2050 roadmap and the 2022 updates here uh, do have a sections on environmental justice policies. I think uh, relevant to our case is here that awareness of environmental justice in, in siting decisions, uh, any siting of, of large scale industrial uh, facilities needs to take into account where these are being placed in, relative to uh, where people live in environmental justice uh, areas. And then also there's the recognition of the high upfront costs, uh, particularly say for, um, homeowners or renters of installing you know, heat pumps or solar and so on. And uh, I know that the recent state legislation that's been passed regarding the climate plan actually has some wording that's going to make it possible for the benefits say of, of solar say on the rooftop of a building to be shared among the renters and so on, special legislation. And so this is something that needs to be uh, really a, a focus for environmental justice is how to ensure that uh, all parts of our community 
uh, are involved in the in the benefits from improved efficiency and electrification, and so on. So I'll just conclude sort of this is some sort of my takeaways uh, and that for the short term, energy efficiency is really the most cost effective step. And that means focusing really on building retrofits and, and new buildings and heat pumps and so on. And that state financial incentives will be available for this. And you know we hope our community would be able to take advantage of it. And as I see it, the demand for electricity is going to rise gradually as, say, as cars get electrified, as buildings get retrofitted and so on. It's not something instantaneous, but slowly but surely all the way to 2050, electricity demand will be slowly rising. And wind energy is going to be the largest source of renewable energy. And which means that if we are starting to do an accounting in Amherst of um, where our renewable energy sources come from, I suppose that we can uh, count our share that comes to, from uh, Eversource, uh, that's their share of the offshore wind. And then the stress on maximizing rooftop solar and the built environment in order to uh, minimize the natural and working lands that are impacted and consider their importance for sequestration, the two sides of the equation. So that's it. If I can stop sharing and uh, do questions. Or... All right, great. Thank you, Martha, for that. That was really um, <clears throat> helpful, I think, for all of us as background on the transition generally and 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 and, and um, specifically on on solar issues that were raised and land use issues that were raised in, uh, at the state level. Yeah. Uh, so that was really helpful. Uh, thank you. I think um, two two things that I recall that you didn't cover yeah, just explicitly yeah. was that um, um, that um, well, first, the electricity, as as you say, um, electricity, while we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions uh, from electricity, our use of electricity has risen and yes. is expected under at least the baseline scenario is about is expected to about double uh, between now and 2050, um, which is it would be actually a good thing yes. <laughs> uh, because yes. uh, that's through the electrification of our transportation and our buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. But just to put in perspective the scale of new uh, electricity generation that we need for the Commonwealth uh, to and 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 while we transition yeah. to to the renewables, the other thing I'd mention is that um, that the uh, while we have um, as um, Martha you mentioned the you know four components of this transition from the electricity generation side is mm -hmm. offshore wind, which we have world class resources. Yeah. Uh, um, Large scale solar, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, large scale hydro uh, from particularly from northern Canada, solar distributed okay. around and electric and bat battery or other energy storage. Uh, mm -hmm. What's important to recognize is that while there can be some um, uh, scenarios where there's a little bit more, a little bit less of each of those, uh, and to the extent that we have less offshore wind, it probably means more solar in addition to potentially nuclear. Uh, but but what's important also to recognize is that all four of those things, or all needed. four of those, of those yes. technologies are complementary in ways to each other. So mm -hmm. it's important that we don't put all of our um, eggs in one basket, if you will, because uh, generally from a broad perspective, offshore wind is generally more prevalent in the wintertime, more mm -hmm. so than solar. Uh, solar more during the heat waves uh, when the wind's mm -hmm. not blowing as much. Uh, yeah. And then, and then the hydro is really a really helpful resource if we can get that down because it, it as Martha mentioned, is a balancing mechanism. Yeah. It's almost like energy storage; it can be ramped up, up and down yeah. quickly. Yeah. Uh, with the, you know, the 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 solar and wind, even though they're intermittent, they're very predictable. Uh, when you implement them on a large geographic scale, uh, ISO New England has all sorts of of. Um, uh, um, uh, methodologies and algorithms to very well predict uh, the solar generation around the state, uh, not necessarily each individual plant, but in total. And likewise with the wind, 
uh, offshore wind. They can predict those things very carefully um, with weather weather forecasts and and um, information technology and smart learning and so forth. Um, and that the, the the hydro then becomes very important as a buffering, as as Martha mentioned, and a ramping as 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 uh, those predictions suggest wind's going to die down, or every evening the sun goes down, the hydro can can ramp up to keep our energy system balanced, and also to recognize that um, you know in in, uh, in in New England, Massachusetts, and the U.S. and many other parts of the world, we are highly reliant and expect and will uh, accept not, nothing other than a high, highly reliable, resilient electricity infrastructure. Uh, so that's that's the uh, challenge in front of the policymakers in ISO New England, uh, but that's why it's really important in, in, in this roadmap uh, that all of these technologies are, are um, move forward uh, together uh, and in ways that complement each other. It was uh, ironic, me... yeah, you know, Tuesday when I was working on this, as I told you, Dwayne, and suddenly our power went off in the neighborhood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, sometimes that's uh, that's not too bad. So, okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, I, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I will put this into a PDF and give it to Stephanie to add to our... Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah thank you. And then thank you again, Martha, for, for uh, putting this together as well as presenting it to us. Um, so let me um, open up for any questions questions or thoughts, comments, takeaways from what Martha presented. Great. Um, yeah, Janet. Um, I just wanted to briefly say thank you for that presentation because that was a tremendous amount of information. I know that's like hundreds of pages of reports. <laughs> um, I, I cut to the chase and I just read the most recent document, which was like a mere 160 pages, but I so, um, you know, and I was, you know, so I'm struck by a lot of things. And one of them is like, there was really no discussion of geothermal mm -hmm. as, as, you know, especially since buildings use a huge amount of energy. And we know that UMass and Amherst College are looking at geothermal. And I kept on thinking, you know, Amher I mean, Massachusetts has a lot of large institutions like that. And so it was, I just, I thought that it was funny. It wasn't there because I do think the technology is getting better, but I also think it's here. And then um, I also thought, you know, I, I always understood that, you know, we were, Mass was looking at um, wind, hydro, and then solar as kind of the supplement. But you could tell, like, as you were reading that report, like the the main referendum where people did not want the transmission lines. And so you just, I, I began to think this is a very shifting landscape all the time. The economies are going to change. The politics are going to change. And, um, you know, it just seemed like what, what Dwayne was saying and what Martha says, is it's like, it's a balanced portfolio and you don't know, you know, it's like it, you're relying on several different sources because you don't know what the winner is or the economics of it. And the other thing I, I also didn't see much was talk about hydrogen for storage. And I began to wonder if Hydro Quebec is going to have a hydrogen plant because they have tons of energy. They just can't get it to the customers. And, you know, I know that is being looked at by, you know, car manufacturers and, you know, truck manufacturers and all that stuff. So I just kind of you know, but I also realize this is such a complicated thing. And, you know, this is a snapshot. This is the plan right now. And, you know, it struck me as a very moderate kind of, you know, a really sensible plan to 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 look at all that. And I was so I was actually personally super encouraged as a lifelong environmentalist that all the times that I have written checks to save land or forests, you know, it's true. You know, it's true that, you know, New England has the largest, you know, inhalation of carbon dioxide in the spring comparable to the Amazon because it's been reforesting. And so, and that wetlands sequester carbon, you know, freshwater wetlands hugely and that we're not protecting them enough. And so part of me felt like, you know, I can't, I was kind of reading this like, oh, what should I switch to after my propane tank? Where's the winner? You know, and it's, you know, and I'm, I'm always looking at the incentives and I'm hoping some girl comes into my home and gives me answers. But I, I thought it was a great report and I, I appreciate your summary of it. I just, it's super complicated, but it, it seems within reach. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, it had to be oversimplified and the and the reports did discuss a little bit the conversion to hydrogen. I just chose to ignore it as being more toward the future. Uh, I, th I think they admitted that new technology hopefully will come along. We're just trying to do the analysis and say, yes, it's feasible even with our current technology, but hopefully batteries will get a lot more 
uh, efficient and uh, helpful. And, and I note that even locally, the companies that are advertising, you know, solar for your home are now saying, and a battery storage, which is, which is interesting. Yeah. And, mo and uh, I think all large scale solar 500, I think it is KW yes. and higher in, in Massachusetts now need to have battery storage. Yes. yes that's them? required by, by yeah. the, by and the late for, laws. For the smart yeah. Program. Yeah, for yes. The yes. Because program. you're trying to shift, you know, the peak from noon away mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, when everybody turns on their stoves in the evening or whatever. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. And, uh, and to some extent, I think um, it's an interesting, in, the, the, sort of particularly on the transportation side, but just generally for energy storage, hydrogen, I think, is a big yes. uh, opportunity and something to keep keep in the yeah. mix for sure and very exciting and has some advantages, especially for longer haul vehicles, I believe. But um, but I think from an analytical perspective, it, it may not matter too much in this decarbonization roadmap because you still need to generate the electricity to store the hydrogen, mm -hmm. to make the hydrogen. So whether it goes into a battery or goes into a hydrogen production uh, may not be that critical in terms of the roadmap ahead. Uh, and and that, that, that these may get into other areas that different parts of the state government are, are working on. Mm -hmm. Great, any other, we're, we're um, a little bit short on time and I'm gonna have to adjust the agenda uh, momentarily, right. but any other questions for, or thoughts for on, on this topic? Great, thank you. Jack has his uh, hand yeah, yeah, Jack, sorry. Yep, I, I keep uh, your sunflowers in your hands look the same, so hard to tell. <laughs> so, so that the, the Martha's uh, presentation was was uh, seemed it was kind of global in nature. Uh, yeah. Here we are in our little committee working on our little little town here, trying to figure out how we can do our fair share, and um, so I'm wondering, you know, what is the fair share that you know, Amherst is obligated uh, to do. I mean, because not all towns can, uh, you know, provide, you know, say based on their land area, a contribution toward things, I guess, you know, but we have our own, uh, what are they, uh, goals that, the set, you know, set forth by the town council that we also want to be zero energy. So there's that. So I guess that's the driver, but, um, yeah, I was just looking at the kind of the global picture and the hoping then for our future conversations, the kind of the global or Massachusetts wide picture would help inform then, uh, you know, what direction we should go locally. But it seems like the local uh, uh, goal set by the town council kind of overrides a lot of this stuff in the oh, state. The, you know, the, that was done back before the latest studies have come out. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think the question of, of what's a, what's our fair share is a uh, is an important one that I think we should take a look at um, in this in some subsequent uh, conversations. Um, and it can be, you know, fairness is defined various can be looked at various different ways if it's land area or population or uh, or energy use ourselves, um, and, and all of those things are different ways to sort of um, consider consider this fairness issue. Uh, which I think, and, and, and you know, the ECAC committee has been looking at this as well, and I think we can get into that a bit uh, later, but let's move on with the agenda, but first to Stephanie and then to Janet. Just real quick for a point of clarity and accuracy, um, the state's goals were set before the council set their goals as well. These reports are updates, but the the council didn't set their goal until I think it was 2020. So, yeah, but, um, or 2019. So the the state goals were were set yeah, in terms the, of the long term. Yeah, the the decarbonization roadmap was published in December of 2020, and the analytic reports then with the right. But the goal were December the 2020. But those were, but the goal the the climate so, so the Global Warming Solutions Act was mm -hmm. the original. Mm -hmm guideline and guidance for the state. Everything yes. came after that. So what yes. I'm saying is that set the goal in the Global Warming Solutions Act and the town council's goals referenced that bigger long-term goal set by the state. And, and these that other, was 80%. 80 the other, right? yeah. Correct, yes. Yes. And that but was but so how you get there from here 
yes. uh, I think is is being sort of you know continually upgraded, studied in the state plans and in what's going on at UMass and absolutely, uh, and, absolutely. And, I just want to state so, though that. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify, though, that you said our goal came after theirs, but that wasn't accurate. That's all I wanted to clarify. Okay. But you're right that they're they are updating how we get there. Yeah, but what the state has more recently done is set intermediate goals of 2025, 2030, and they're going to have to they're by legislation now they're going to have to set goals. I think for every five years, uh -huh. maybe five years ahead of time or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, quickly, Janet, and then Dan, please. I'm, a, I'm just a little confused about like fair share of what, because it seems yeah. to be, um, you know, like I would think that the council's goal of zero um, energy is how do we get to that? And so that could be, you know, solar, it could be buying into wind power, it could be buying green power from another community, it could be buying it from New York State, apparently. Or, um, and so I don't like fair share of what, like, I don't get that. that, that that's the discussion that we might have. I, I um, agree that it doesn't, the, the goals that the town has established does not suggest um, that we need to be self-sufficient uh, in terms of producing that our, ourselves. Um, but um, to the extent, you know, but it gets into the equity issue. If we're not producing our own, then we're putting the burden on some other jurisdictions to produce for us. But that may be fair because if it's offshore, uh, it's not in anybody's backyard, quite frankly. Um, okay, uh, Dan, and then let's move to to sort of close this out. Uh, yeah. So first off, I have a hard stop at two. So sorry, I'm going to have to leave a little bit before we wrap up. Um, but does does this document um, account for the carbon uh, emissions associated with producing the green infrastructure? That they're saying is going to be developed. Um, I think the analysis of the eight pathways does some of that, but I I really don't don't know how much. Okay. Yeah, and and then yeah. the other question <laughs> would be: Is that something that the town accounts for in our goals? Yeah, I mean, that I think is, I think the issues are so complex that, uh, you know, our town has to be really careful uh, to consider, you know, all the complexities, uh, you know, and, and as you say, you know, what what's goes into, uh, you know, all the construction or this and that, uh, uh, I mean, the, yeah, let me let, let's. Um, it's a good question, Dan. I, I think there's several ways to answer that, um, but maybe we can um, cogitate on that and, and and bring that up uh, at at a, at a subsequent time. I particularly with your leaving, I'm going to uh, punt on the review of the work plan and timeline for the next meeting. We'll start off with that on the agenda uh, next time. Um, and uh, but let's also then uh, quickly turn to scheduling our next meeting. Uh, and I say that particularly because um, if we want to go back to Friday every two weeks, uh, that does not work for me, okay. um, uh, uh, which would, would would land us on the 26th. Um, I'm actually on vacation the week of the 22nd, um, and I'm wondering whether we might um, then set our next meeting um, if we want to get back on Friday, uh, if it would be three weeks, if people don't think that's too long. Um, uh, but otherwise, we could try to stick with the uh, the Thursday time frame. Though I do have a bit of an issue um, tw uh, at at uh, about one at, at one o'clock <clears throat> on um, next next uh, September first. But <clears throat> September second, um, the, the our noon <clears throat> sorry our noon to two time block noon to two p.m. works. Well, with me, but I'm just one. So, how does that work for other folks? And Stephanie, did you have a thought on that? No, I just I was um, going to encourage you to give the actual date, which you just did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dan, uh, I'm not available on September first or second. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have others? Yeah. You anybody need a else? Quorum. I'm available on the first, and maybe not the second. I could do it earlier in the week. Um, 
what's is there a problem stephanie with that of like changing up the time all the time or i mean no. i do want to eventually maybe when the fall semester starts for those of us who are academics to try to uh find a uh a, a time that we can just mark on our calendars uh going forward but um, the only requirement is that it works for the committee members yeah. and you have a quorum and that it's posted 48 yeah. hours prior to the meeting okay. and if you announce the date here that's even better okay i mean we do we have to still post it but yeah. it's helpful that you're announcing it during this meeting yeah so if Great. you can agree to a time now that's best Great. how does um wednesday at noon work the when, wednesday the 31st of august i could do that yeah. works for me yeah. cool let's do that that also reduces our uh, our interval uh, i'm sorry uh, can you repeat the time again wednesday yeah, 31st so we'll august. Meet next on wednesday august 31st at noon to two o'clock 2 p.m and i think okay. that will also work out with you in terms of posting uh, on uh, monday yes uh, that should be fine. Monday morning. <laughs> I, I, I posted before. Chris, would... is that, could Chris, is that going to affect the planning board meeting that night, your your schedule? It can make it fun, less fun day. <laughs> I don't think we'll have a planning board meeting that night unless something comes up. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, great. So let's settle on Wednesday the 31st at noon and, and for our two-hour meeting okay so with that um i know we've reached the uh, two o'clock hour but let me ask if there if, if stephanie if you're if you're okay um asking if there's any public uh, comment from the public that we have sure. participating today and sorry again to the attendees that we um went past the two o'clock mark so if anyone from the public is interested in making a comment, please electronically, digitally raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And also a reminder while we're waiting for that for Jack, as I mentioned at the very beginning, meaning you're you're on tap for the meeting minutes um, on August 31st. Yeah. I don't see anyone raising their hand, so I don't believe there's any public comment. Great. Well, appreciate that. Appreciate um, uh, the public uh, listening and and uh, um, listening in and um, uh, being part of this. Uh, so with that, uh, let me, do I have a motion? I need a motion to adjourn, I think. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Do I need a motion to adjourn? <laughs> You can just make ask for a motion and someone can say so moved and someone second and then you're good. Okay, okay. I'll say so, so moved. <laughs> I'm so moved, yes. Okay. Um, and do we okay. have a do second? We, do we have a second to I'll second. Okay, I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Um, it doesn't sound like we need a voice vote. So no, um, you're good. we are good to go. And, and thank you uh, again to uh, uh, Chris and, and to Martha for the presentations today and for everybody for um, uh, participating. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you Bye-bye. All right.